Join us as we journey into the past. Who were the people? What were they like? How did they begin and how did they end? Let's find out on the Fan of History, episode 15. Last time on the Fan of History, from 911 BC onwards, the Assyrians fight to reclaim the Middle Assyrian Empire that was lost. Last time, they invented the cavalry. All right. So, Dan, what is happening next? Well, we have come to the death of the cult in Inurta in 883 BC. But as I said before, to cult in Inurta II, the king of Assyria, the chosen lord of Asher, he was old when he became king. Right. So he has his grown-up son, and this son, Ashur Nasibal II, becomes the king of Assyria. Many consider this guy the true founder of the empire, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be <laughs> because he is so fantastic. There is, um, there is a mold that all Assyrian kings try to fit. They sort of try to look the same and behave the same. And this guy very much sets the mold. He is uh, by many considered to be the true founder of the empire. Mm -hmm. And the three kings before him had prepared the way. But this is where it really gets going. And just to give you uh, an idea about who he is, I will give you his full title. What is it? He is the supreme, the merciless, the destroyer of opposition, the exalted king, the shepherd, the protector of the quarters of the world, the king, the word of whose mouth destroys mountain and seas, who by his lordly attack has forced mighty and merciless kings from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same to acknowledge one supremacy. And this title goes on all his documents. <laughs> <laughs> that letterhead must be enormous. <laughs> yes, you have. So you can sort of zoom zoom out when he starts talking. He will, he will go on about how great he is. Uh, he is an ambitious and able monarch. He is a fighter, a hunter, a builder, and a boaster. And. Uh, but most of all, he is the number one cruel Assyrian king. So, when faced with opposition, Ashur Nasirpal II will become very angry and do horrible things. And we have many atrocities in war today, but few <laughs> any come to the level of Ashur Nasirpal II. Wow. So we'll talk more about that in two episodes. Okay. Uh, when he really gets going. But I think the, the thing with his early years, the four years we'll talk about now, is that uh, they are not as well documented. So we just probably don't know the details of <laughs> his atrocities. But the thing he does when he becomes the king is to immediately attack someone, anyone. And he decides to go up the greater Saab River to the east, up to the Sagros Mountain, to a place called place called the Kabku. He crushes all opposition. He loots and ravages. And that's all the details we get this far. He puts a victory stele on Mount Equi. He builds a city named Al Ashur Nasirpal. And this first campaign is uh, has a second part because he turns to the northeast and uh, receives the tribute of the land Kadmuku. Um, he will campaign 14 times in his full reign, uh, and that's quite a lot. But uh, when he's doing the second campaign of 883 BC, he gets word that uh, the Aramean kings by the Kabul River, who is blocking his goal to control the upper Euphrates, because the Assyrians really want to control the land between the upper Euphrates and the upper Tigris River, that's their heartland of the Middle Assyrian Empire, and they still don't have control of all of this. And now these Arameans are making incursions into Assyria. 
Uh-oh. Behöver jag att det är Syrians actually control. And Ashur Nassibal becomes really angry. <laughs> But we also have to talk about China. Because okay. in the same year, 883 uh, BC, there is some sort of trouble in China. It seems that the Duke I of Qi has uh, disputed the king. Uh, so there is a There is maybe a civil war, but at least there is a fight between uh, the king who has to side uh, and the duke I of Qi. And the king has to side with the Marquis of Ji, who is a very powerful noble, and together they take down Duke I of Qi. And Duke I is being boiled to death in a large cauldron <laughs> for his for this dispute, and Ashanasipal would approve. <laughs> <laughs> And King Yi installs Duke Ai's younger half-brother Jing on the throne of Qi. And he will be known as the Duke Hu of Qi. So the noble lords are very powerful in Yu China. But uh, for now, the king is uh, in control of the lords. Hmm. That's a, that's a lot of violence that happens. <laughs> I don't know if we've seen uh, yes. so much... But Ashur Nasipal II is just getting started, like the whole uh, Neo-Syrian Empire. It's still very early. Uh, next year, mm-hmm. in 882 BC, Ashur Nasipal is ready to go to war. And now he has his army fully mustered. Uh, he has probably 50,000 guys. Uh, as I have mentioned before, the process is that in, in the spring, everybody who is anything in Assyria shows up for the master and wants to go to war with the king. But not everyone is chosen, so it's a great honor to go on this campaign. 50,000 guys, superior equipment to anybody else nearby. And this year, uh, Ashur Nasipal II goes north along the Tigris into the Nairi lands, like his father. And he actually comes up on a statue that his father put there during his campaigns, uh, just a couple of years earlier next to a statue of Tiglath Pileser I, who was the king of the Middle Assyrian Empire. But Ashur gets uh, irritated by these statues, and he thinks that oh, I am much better than these guys. <laughs> so he puts a slightly bigger statue of himself. <laughs> But um, the people of the Nairi lands, they are like, this guy doesn't seem to be like the other guys. So they decide to uh, yield and pay tribute. So Ashur doesn't find anybody to fight. But then there is one guy, Kulaya, who decides not to pay his tribute. <laughs> And that's a pretty huge mistake then, because then Ashur II has a target. He attacks uh, the city of Kulaya, plunders it and destroys it, and claims another city, Tushka, as an Assyrian colony. So he builds a depot of weapons and stuff there and sets it up as a local headquarter in the north uh, under Assyrian uh, control. And uh, his father also went to uh, the, the Bitsadini tribe and conquered them and made them swear an oath to him. And they, their leader was Amebal A. And he's still around. He's still the leader of the Bitsadini. And when Ashur II shows up, he remembers what happened last time, so he renews his oath and pays tribute to Ashur Nasipal. Uh, and uh, we have to remember Amebal. Um, we will show up later again in the story. There are there are like these mini kingdoms in the Nairi land, so they have these random names, and sometimes the na- names never come back, so it's very hard to know where these kingdoms were. But there is a, a, <laughs> a small kingdom called Nairia, And another court, small kingdom called Ixala. They all, uh, they both swear tribute to, or pays tribute and swears filthy to uh, Ashur Nasipal II. So very early in this campaign season, he has won everything in the north that he planned. But remember that those, um, the Aramean kings by the Kabo River were giving him problems. They are in North Syria and it's just south of the mountains. So he, He takes a path through the mountains that makes him arrive north of um, these Aramean kings. And okay. they, they expected him from the east. Right. 
And he now comes down from the mountains about, surprise, here I am. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> wow. And uh, they are surprised by his appearance and this great army. So they immediately decide to give him a lot of gifts and <laughs> swear loyalty <laughs> oaths to him. So it's uh, the Arameans, the Neo Hittite states nearby, they do the same. And the kings of the Kanil Gabat, this is also an area where uh, the Assyrians have huge interests. Uh, they also submit and pay tribute. And everybody says that Ashur is the best god, and Ashurnasipal is our great overlord, and uh, whoa, whoa, we really like you Assyrians. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> that you came this year. <laughs> and uh, Ashurnasipal makes them swear this really strong oaths and he's like if you ever break these oaths I will be back and I'll be really mad they are okay <laughs> he believe you yeah, right it's like uh, hey if if you promise not to murder us hey, we'll, we'll give you all the all these things just please don't murder us but for some reason, they will forget how or how frightful he and his army was, and they, some of them will break these oaths, and we'll see what happens then. The, the Neo Hittites, being the most civilized people uh, nearby, and uh, arguably even more civilized than the Assyrians, they, they carry the heritage of the Great Hittite Empire. They realize that they have something that the other ones don't have, so they decide to get some extra points with Ashurnasipal. So they give him a tour of the Hittite palaces, the old palaces of the ancient empire. And it shows him a lot of art. And Ashurnasipal is really impressed with mm. the Hittite art. So we'll find that in all Assyrian works, uh, after this point, there is a strong Hittite influence. Uh, particularly the, the Lamassu, the, uh, these huge man beast things. <laughs> Right. Uh, they, they come from the Hittite uh, culture, but they are very much adopted by Ashurnasipal II. So he's like, this is great art. I want art like this. Build me art like this. <laughs> and he, he puts up people in Assyria into looking into building this art. He probably hires a couple of Hittites as well, or gets them as tribute. <laughs> right. <laughs> to, to create some great art. But... He needs to find another target, and now he wants a target that will fight back. And he's still allied. He, um, we don't have details about this, but it seems that Ashurnasipal II has renewed the oaths of his father with Babylon. So he never ever considers Babylon a target. And he will never go to war with Babylon. And neither will Babylon. So this is, uh, I'll get back to this in a later episode, but it's okay. really, really good for Babylon. <laughs> Because they don't have anything to put up against this. <laughs> I was about to say, I don't know. If he's looking for a fight, I don't know if Babylon would be much of a. Very much true. Of a fight. And, and probably he could get some internal uh, resistance if he went against Babylon. Uh, first, he would be an oathbreaker, and second, to wreck a great culture, and the Assyrians are sensitive about uh, beating up Babylonians and plundering Babylonian cities as well. They think that's uh, sacrilegious. Mm. Well, that makes sense. But there are a lot of people that Assyrians don't have any second thoughts about beating up. <laughs> Some of them are to the east, and it appears that there's an ancient kingdom called Samua in the Sagros Mountains, in like the foothills of the Sagros Mountains, exposed to the wrath of the Assyrians. <laughs> near the headwaters of the Diala River. And uh, there is a city, uh, or there, there is an Assyrian city called Khaleesi. Uh, <laughs> it That's has nothing to do with Game of Thrones. <laughs> I was about to say, that, sounds, that also sounds very familiar. <laughs> uh, and please note that Ashurnasipal II has a longer title than Daenerys Targaryen. <laughs> uh, the city Khaleesi is 60 kilometers southeast of Nineveh, and uh, Ashurnasipal II will use this as the base for the campaign. Uh, like his father, he doesn't use the old capital Asher as the base for his campaign. But now he moves to a new city. So he makes uh, all the soldiers gather in Khaleesi. And this is very close to um, uh, the Cyrus Mountains. Uh, and um, there is uh, a sheikh, 
uh, of the land Dagara, close to Samoa, also a mini kingdom in the Sagros foothills, called Nur Adad. Very confusing because we had a guy called Nur Adad being beat up by Assyrians just a couple of episodes ago. But uh, there is an inscription saying that Nur Adad had rebelled. Uh, I don't know why he had rebelled. I don't know if he had any agreement with the Assyrians. But uh, he, he knew that uh, this rebellion of his was would probably incur the wrath of Ashur Nasipal II. So he has uh, built a great wall in the one pass leading to his... Uh, uh, leading to uh, Samoa and Dagara. It's called the Pass of Babitu. And Ashurnasipal has to besiege this wall to get into the mountains to find his victims. Uh, and this is his first big challenge. And we don't have the details, but uh, the wall uh, is broken through. And Ashurnasipal enters the lands of uh, Samoa and Dagara. We only get details like slaughtering and plundering, <laughs> but uh, it is a total Assyrian victory. And Ashur Nasipal has uh, the idea of uh, finding laborers. He's very interested in finding slave laborers, and particularly skilled ones. So he spares all the skilled workers he finds, but he totally uh, wrecks these kingdoms. So he basically takes all their, um, what you want to call it, intellectual IP. <laughs> yes, and he also sort of destroys their cities and take their non-intellectual IP as slaves. <laughs> right. Uh, he actually goes even further to a place called Mount Nisir. This is one of the mountains where Noah's Ark is supposed to have uh, uh, ended up. It's hmm. mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's probably a mountain that is today called Pir Umar Gudrun. It's about 9,000 feet high. And on this mountain, he erects a stele. And this marks the total destruction of the kingdom of Samoa. So uh, uh, he builds a new city, or a town rather, called Dur Ashur. And he makes this a local headquarters as well. He puts in weapon depots and an Assyrian governor. Hmm. And this, uh, the city of Dur Ashur will return as an Assyrian for sort of front base in when they do further expeditions into the Sagrat Mountains against the, the mountain tribes. Is this the, you said he established a governor. Was this a common practice at the time? There is, uh, it, it is possible that Ashur Nasipal starts this uh, by installing governors and sort of creating new provinces. Hmm. Uh, and he also will, maybe at this point, maybe later, make sure that these governors are, uh, the, the, his idea is that the governors should be eunuchs so that they don't establish dynasties. Ah. So that when, when the governor dies, he has to appoint another eunuch. I gotcha. Uh, so that he doesn't, uh, uh, this practice will eventually be abandoned and it will lead to great problems for Syria. So uh, Ashur Nasipal II had the great, had a good idea there to put eunuchs as governors. Right, because then you, yeah, like you said, you couldn't have a hereditary title at that point. Yes, and this is exactly the problem that uh, the Zhou uh, royal dynasty of China will run into. Uh, because they will not put eunuchs as governors. <laughs> so they will have hereditary dynasties all around them. Uh, right. In 881 BC, King Ji can't catch a break, so there are wars in the south. And the Shu, who are not, uh, they are sometimes in, uh, sort of, Yo, the Yo sphere of control and sometimes not. But they ally with the barbarian tribe called the Dongji. And there is a, a historical note from this time saying that during the reign of King Ji, royal power was not strong and the regional rulers failed to obey the court. And this is exactly the problem that Ashnasipal II tries to prevent. Right. Of course, he doesn't know anything about uh, China. Uh, in 880 BC then, 
Ashurnasi Pal II does the unthinkable. He breaks with 1,000 years of tradition, and this does not happen very often. But he decides to go with his father's idea and uh, to its natural conclusion that move the capital. Because mm. Asher is located in totally wrong place, takes ages to go from Asher to the war. All right. <laughs> all the wars that he plans. Uh, and he's now very wealthy. And he has all these laborers that he has taken on his campaigns. So he decides to build a new capital. And there is a small village called Kalhu. This has been located. It's in modern Nimrud in Iraq. And you will often hear in historical, in sort of modern history, that they refer to this place as Nimrud. But uh, it, it, that's a very modern name. So the name is Kala or Kalhu. Uh, it was a small village established by Shalmaneser I, I think, in like... Uh, the 14th century BC but uh, the village has fallen on hard times and it's just very small but it's uh, located at a great site so it's almost nothing and he builds a great city perhaps uh, uh, one of the biggest cities in in Mesopotamia and uh, he wants to make this city spectacular bigger and better than Asher (laughs) Well, it's kind of, he wants to make it his. Look at his wonderful thing he created with all of his spoils. Yeah, and we, we'll talk a lot more about Asher Nasipal the second in upcoming episode. This was just his early warming up period. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he's the third greatest of all the Neo Syrian kings uh, of the entire empire. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm really impressed with what he accomplished. And it often gets, um, overshadowed by his enormous cruelty. <laughs> That's gonna happen. <laughs> but we have, he, he makes 14 campaigns and he doesn't really ever lose a war. So he will, uh, it's unclear exactly when it happens, but he's very close to and probably does realize the goal of restoring the Middle Assyrian Empire. But when they succeed in restoring the Middle Assyrian Empire, they have sort of forgotten that that was their goal and they just keep going. Hmm. Um, so they, o- they overshoot. Yes, they will overshoot the Middle Assyrian Empire with the... Uh, uh, with a great, <laughs> uh, people <laughs> did a lot, and uh, yeah. So often, when people talk about the Assyrian Empire, they always always means mean this empire, the third empire, the biggest empire, the Neo Assyrian Empire. Gotcha. But other things are happening in the Middle East as well. We have the King of Israel, Omri. Mm-hmm. He attacks Moab. Moab is a small country to the southeast of Israel, to the east of what will become Judah. Uh, and this is why we have uh, Omri mentioned on this Meshe stele, Moab stele, a stone erected by a later king of Moab. And this war is successful. Omri forces Moab to become a vassal state of Israel. And uh, he also realizes that the location of the Israel capital, Tirsa, is, isn't very good. Mm-hmm. So he decides to buy a hill <laughs> at the perfect location. I don't know who is buying it from, but the price apparently was 60 kilograms of silver. And on this hill, he builds the Israel capital of Samaria. Okay. And Samaria will remain the capital of Israel until the fall of the kingdom. So Jerusalem will turn up as the, the capital of Judah, but Samaria is the capital of Israel. And there is archaeological evidence that there is a great amount of building at Samaria at this point. And Samaria is not that far from Tyre and the Phoenicians. And it seems that the Phoenicians are involved in this. They are probably helping out. They are selling a lot of stuff to uh, Omri. And he has an alliance going, especially with Tyre, uh, the Phoenician city. So Omri is now a power player in Canaan, 
and he uh, has this little growing kingdom going. And he's still far enough from Assyria not to notice Shun Nasipal II. So things are looking bright for Israel. So how long have you been going now? Um, let's see. Let me look at the minutes. Looks like about just at 30. Okay, then I can confuse you with, I can start to mess up Egypt. Uh -oh. Because now, now Egypt will uh, get complicated. Because <laughs> earlier we have, you know, I mentioned that Choshing started the 22nd dynasty. Right. And all the 21st, uh, all the first 21 dynasties have been sequential. There's like Dynasty 1, Dynasty 2, Dynasty 3. Very orderly. But now the 23rd Dynasty starts. While okay. the 22nd Dynasty will still be going on for uh, 150 years. Wait, That's what? <laughs> so the 23rd Dynasty starts before the 22nd ends? Yes. And there huh. will even be a 24th Dynasty. Uh, before the 22nd ends. Wow. Okay. So I'll try to explain this, but it is very confusing to me. <laughs> so I expect it to be confusing to you and the listeners as well. Um, there is a, a guy called Har Siese A. He's the first pharaoh of the 23rd dynasty. His father was a high priest in Thebes, that is in the south of Egypt, what is okay. called Upper Egypt, because the Egyptians can't, uh, they don't think in north and south terms, they think in terms of the Nile, so you know, right. the Upper Nile, because the Nile runs south, uh, runs north to the Mediterranean. And his father was a high priest in Thebes called Shoshenk C. Uh, so Harsiese A. Uh, does not only become the high priest, but is a full-fledged pharaoh of the south. So apparently the 22nd dynasty has lost control of the south, because Takelot the I is still the king in the north. Uh, they are all Libyans, and they are all related to each other. That's why the names are like Shokshenk. Right. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's even disputed which Libyan belongs to which dynasty. And the 24th dynasty will also be Libyans. It will be messy wow. and it will be messy for a long time in many episodes. I might skip Egypt earlier than I did in the YouTube show because <laughs> just that so confusing. The 25th dynasty will sort this out and create one Egypt again. But in a sense, it's still, it's still one Egypt. It just has several pharaohs at the same time. But there will be a guy called Pi, and he will sort this out for us, hopefully. But that's much later than this. <laughs> okay. Wow. That is really confusing. <laughs> it is. And it will become much worse. Is this? I'm guessing this goes back to the whole issue of the uh, pharaoh ruling in one area, but then the priests or the religious having more power in a different area. It is similar to what happened in the 21st dynasty when right. the priests were ruling the south. But this is different in that uh, Harsiyase A actually calls himself Pharaoh. And he doesn't count the years in the years of Taglot I, but he counts in his own years. Okay. So this is more serious a division than the 21st dynasty. And it's just two generations after Shoshenk, and his great goal was to stop this. <laughs> So you could say the Shoshink failed. Right. Okay. And that is finally it for the 880s BC. And we'll soon get to decades that are much more interesting, or much more, have much more content than this one. That's a, that's a lot of stuff to happen just in the 880s. Yes, it's amazing that we know this much for something that happened 2,900 years ago. Well, that's pretty crazy. Well, folks, if you liked this, please consider the Patreon, patreon.com slash fanofhistory. Also, you can watch episodes on YouTube. 
There are some, it's a nice visual representation of similar content. Go ahead and like and subscribe there. Also, give us a review on iTunes. This is on iTunes. We're also on Facebook, slash Fan of History, on Twitter, at The Fan of History. And if you want to visit the website, it's thefanofhistory.wordpress.com. And am, uh, that's, uh huh. I'm having, uh, I'm thinking a lot about YouTube and this podcast. And I sure. Think- this podcast is perhaps a better way to convey this information. YouTube is, uh, you, you don't really need to be visual. I think people have an easier time listening to this than to sort of follow 100% attention a YouTube show. But I will be hopefully experimenting a bit on YouTube and, uh, this might sort of decide the direction we're taking this podcast in, in, uh, uh, next year. Mm-hmm. So please check out the YouTube and tell me what you like and don't like there. Uh, we are right now. I'm looking into. I, we are recording this in early May 2015, and right now I'm looking into uh, having another person create another show on YouTube and having me just as a narrator uh, and not not doing the research and stuff because that's what takes a lot of time. So we, we may be starting another series on the YouTube channel starting in 200,000 BC. So 200,000? Yeah, we thought that 880 BC, that's sort of like yesterday. It's very <laughs> modern history, so we decided to go even further back. Wow. Yeah, that's a real long time. Yeah. So hopefully there is something on YouTube about that at, when you listen to this. Excellent. We have one more thing before we go. Nope, that's it, folks. Thanks for listening. No, no, no. We have one more thing. We have to play Assyrian or Babylonian. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, I get to, I get to prove what I don't know to all the nice folks listening. Well, uh, you haven't done very well at this. I have, I have this done terribly. Is my favorite subject. Oh yeah. Women. Well. I do have a lot of sisters, so maybe that has prepared me for this episode. <laughs> kind of uh, but we are talking Assyrian or Babylonians. So I will give you five names of five names. famous women. Okay. You will have to tell me if they are Assyrian or Babylonian. Okay. I will do my best. Okay, here's the first one. Semiramis. Sem... Semiramis? Semiramis. Hmm. Semiramis. I'm going to go Semiramis. That sounds familiar, but I don't know why it would be familiar. Queen, I'm guessing? Uh, that's very likely, yes. Yes, she's queen. Mentioned well, by none other than Julius Caesar in his writing. Huh. Well, the I'm gonna... Caesar did not know, uh, wasn't very good at Mesopotamian history. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say Assyrian. You are correct. Yes. We will actually talk about Semiramis for a full episode because this is a legendary queen and the Romans and the Greeks got their Mesopotamian history all messed up. But there is an historical person that could be the sort of basis of the legend of Semiramis. Uh, she's uh, in the legend. She's a super powerful queen that rules the entire world. Wow. Uh, we'll talk about her a lot in uh, around 811 BC. Maybe that's where I heard her before. Uh, you probably did. So you are 1 0 this time. Yes. So let's awesome. give you the second girl from ancient history. Let's do it. It's Saditu. Saditu? D2. Hmm. That's a unusually short name. Saditu. Is that one word or two? One word. Saditu. Saditu. Hmm. This might be the hardest round so far, actually, because there are no uh, god names in this name. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, like. There are no hints. Uh, so D two. 
Gosh, I am I am drawing a complete blank. You have to take a wild guess. Wild guess, Sadi two. Well, I guess I can't dally any longer. I am going to go with Assyrian again. You are correct. <laughs> It's the daughter of Sennacherib. Um, it, oh, okay. I really got my research that far yet, but I think she does some very clever things uh, on the behalf of his, her father. So um, we'll talk about her later. All right. Okay, now you only have to get one more right out of oh these my three amazing girls. 33% chance, folks. Yeah, the first one is Libali Sarat. That's two words. Le- Bali, Surat? Yeah, Surat. you could say that uh, people who think they know history, they uh, only know history if they know about Libali Surat. Really? No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like, that's the craziest thing I've heard you say so far. <laughs> Libali Surat. Hmm. The Surat. Queen. Queen Labali Surat. Wow. I don't know. It's the Surat part that sounds familiar, but why does Surat sound familiar to me? It shouldn't. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to say Labali Surat is Babylonian. No. Oh, also no. Assyrian. Also Assyrian. Triple Assyrian you hit me with. Queen of Ashur Banipal. Okay. One of the two kings who might be greater than Ashur Nasipal II, but uh, we'll talk about him in about 50 episodes or so, so that's later. Okay, mm. the fourth uh, queen. Also a queen. Also a queen, okay. Two words. Elat Gula. Elat Gula? Yes. Assyrian or Babylon? The Lot Gula. This Two words. Ever. You should uh, play this game with your friends. <laughs> yes, this is... This is uh, a killer at parties. All the girls will be impressed. Yes. Yes, the, it will definitely kill parties. So feel <laughs> free <laughs> to use this. <laughs> so, Elat Gula, Assyrian or Babylonian? Have to get it right, Brandon. Feel the pressure. Babylonian. Yes. Oh, look at that. You have won this round, though, Sir. Oh my goodness. Look at me, folks. Yes, the bonus round, the the fifth. Okay. Fifth one. Actually, Sadito wasn't a queen, but uh, oh, uh, Belat Sunat. Belat Sunat. I'm not making these names up. (laughs) I think you are. (laughs) Belat Sunat. Yes. Huh. That's... That's a weird name. (laughs) Yeah. uh, The trick with this contest is, uh, of course, that uh, all the names are Mesopotamian, so the Assyrians have a problem. (laughs) The same name is for everything. <laughs> okay. Babylonian. There's nothing on the line here. You can just answer. I'm going to say Babylonian. <laughs> you are correct. Oh. oh. Four, one. Yes. Well done, sir. Dominated the round. Total. All right. Let's bore the listeners further. <laughs> okay, yes. All right, you don't have to listen to me fumble around for and fumble around in my brain for random bits of info that I have accumulated. So, for the fan of history, I am Brennan. I'm Dom. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash fanofhistory. Just a dollar an episode would help us out. Thanks, and see you next time.